The proceeding will start shortly. The order, order. This is the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee and this is our hearing in two parts into the governance of cricket and the governance of football. Uh, we are joined in our first panel by representatives from the Professional Cricketers Association. We are joined by Rob Lynch, Chief Executive, Professional Cricketers Association, who was formerly the Treasurer, I believe, Rob. Uh, James Harris, the no. Chair. Sorry, Chair, that's incorrect. I'm no, not been the treasurer. You director. haven't been the treasurer in the past. Financial director? No. Commercial director. Rob, Rob was hired to the PCA as commercial director and promoted into the chief executive. Okay, president. thank you. I was misinformed. Okay, so and then we've got James Harris, chair, professional critics association. Anuj Dal, vice chair, professional critics association. And junior, Julian, I should get Julian right, didn't I? <laughs> Matherill, non executive chair, professional critics association. So Rob, James, Anuj, and Julian, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Now, before I move to our first question, which will be Kevin Brennan, I just want to declare some interest. Firstly, my own. I'm uh, chair of the Lords and Commons Cricket Club. I've also accepted hospitality uh, in the last year from uh, the England uh, and Wales Cricket Board. Um, and Kevin Brennan as well with interests. I also received hospitality in the last year from Glamorgan County Cricket Club. Thank you. Uh, our first questions uh, come from Kevin Brennan. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming before the committee. Could I ask you, um, Mr Lynch, do you think um, that players' union should have been more supportive of Azim Rafiq? Perhaps, perhaps I could. Uh, well, no, I'm asking Mr Lynch first, if I may. Look, we, um, we, we had some failings in our dealings with uh, Azim Rafiq and have learnt a lot of lessons um, from the last 12 months um, with Azim. Um, we applaud Azim uh, for, for his courage and bravery and, and being the whistleblower coming forward to create the necessary change within the game. Uh, the PCA has offered support to Azeem um, throughout his career, and, but clearly in this dispute with uh, Yorkshire, we did not meet the standards we would have wished to. Um, we have apologised, um, both Julian and I, directly to Azeem um, for um, where we uh, went wrong. Um, we have listened to Azim as to what he feels are the issues in the game um, and what can be done better and a number of changes have been introduced um, and you're well aware of the 12 point plan that um, we are a stakeholder uh, to and, and the game coming together to create the necessary change that we need to. One point um, in his evidence to the committee um, Mr. Rafiq um, said that, um, that the PCA had actually called the police because they were so concerned about his welfare. Um, and, and, and he received a phone call from the police that, that said, you've been reported missing. Um, and he also said he didn't feel that that was done because of real concern about his welfare, but more concern about the fact that um, that if he killed himself, that, they, that the, 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 the PCA could say, well, we did what we could in his case. I mean, Mr. Brown, I, I made that I, I haven't I, asked, I made I that haven't asked you to answer the question yet. Sorry. Please, we do have order here, Mr. Metherall. I apologise. You may not be used to our procedures, but everything is done through the chair, and I've at the moment been asked by the chair to ask some questions. So if I may, I'll come to you in a moment. I apologise. Um, did you see that? evidence when it was given to the committee, Mr Lynch, and what was your reaction to it as the Chief Executive of the um, Professional Cricketers Association? Yes, I um, saw the evidence um, and it was hard to hear. Um, uh, the action that we took um, was born from nothing other than genuine worry for Azim's welfare at a time um, where he was under a lot of pressure and scrutiny. and. Um, having consulted with my colleague, our Director of Welfare and Development, um, who we procedurally have to um, um, uh, uh, talk to each other about these very difficult matters, and also talking to the ECB's safeguarding team, um, there was a decision made to um, ask the police for a safe and secure check, which is different to a missing persons check. That is a, f a factually incorrect statement that was made um, in this committee. Um, 
I don't feel it appropriate to go into the exact details that led us to making um, that decision. I, I, I would like to keep those in, in confidence, but we were genuinely concerned that caused me um, certainly sleepless nights um, before we took that action, but it was absolutely out of no other driver than um, Azim's safety. Elsewhere in his um, evidence, um, Mr Rafiq <coughs> said that, um, having spoken to the, uh, the ECB as well about um, his concerns, um, he said, I kept begging the ECB the P and the PCA. The PCA kept telling me, we agree with Yorkshire. Um, he, says, he said to us, I'm telling them they're not doing the right thing, they're changing processes, they're not communicating with me, this is going to end up in a car crash for everyone, please step in. And, and then he went on to say at no point did any of the two organisations want to do that until the article broke that uh, they mentioned. What's your, what's your reaction to that, looking back on those events as somebody who's come in with a fresh pair of eyes to this. Yeah, sure. And I, I said at um, the start of my response to you that we had some failings and some learnings through this experience. And um, Azim is right. One of those key learnings that we have made is we should have stepped in and put more uh, public pressure on both Yorkshire and the ECB. What we did, which was wrong, was put too much faith in the process that Yorkshire um, were undertaking, or at least under, uh, telling us they were undertaking, and that was wrong. We should have come out, we should have said in the media that we wanted Yorkshire to conclude the inquiry firstly in a much more timely manner and, um, and make those uh, findings known. Um, the engagement we had with Yorkshire um, was very subpar, and, and Julian and I led that, and, and Julian was in direct contact with the Yorkshire chair. Um, but that, along with learnings from this being, or the nature of this being, a member-on-member -member dispute for us, um, which created some extraordinary challenges for us to deal with, and we are certainly better equipped to deal with them now, having implemented uh, a legal panel of barristers that we've now put in place that enables us to provide that support to any member now, but uh, uh, maintain our independence. Mr. Medrell, is there something you'd like to add to Mr. Lynch's answers? Yes. Um, we, I, I personally tried to contact Mr. Hutton on a number of occasions, both on email and by telephone. Um, Azim was pleading with us to find out um, the terms of reference of the inquiry, the timing of that inquiry, and uh, those calls and those emails went unanswered. Uh, until I sent a note to Mr Hutton and said that we were under increasing pressure from the media to comment and I would be forced to go public um, and say that Yorkshire was not returning any of our calls. Uh, Mr Hutton then did speak to me, but I'm afraid, as this committee well knows, um, nothing we received from Yorkshire um, uh, or, uh, at that time was in any way helpful. But as, as Mr. Lynch has said, one of our failings at the PCA is that we placed far too much confidence in Yorkshire, the independent inquiry, and the ECB to uh, give us an independent report uh, and a regulatory process expeditiously that we could then have acted upon. Okay. Can I ask you, Mr. Lynch, how many others have been in touch with you about issues with racism in their clubs? Sorry, could you just repeat the sound? I beg your pardon. How many other players have been in touch with you about issues of racism in their clubs? This hasn't been um, something that's just come <clears throat> up in the last couple of months. I, I need to take you back um, to uh, mid-2020 when I joined um, the organisation which was in line with the, the BLM movement and uh, we were questioned rightfully and strongly by a section of our memberships as to our stance on racism um, and uh, in the game uh, off the back of that. Um, what we did is stop, look at ourselves, consult with our members to understand this issue better because quite simply I and, and my colleagues um, didn't have enough of a knowledge on it. Um, we then felt it appropriate to quickly set up uh, an equality, diversity and inclusion working group that uh, reports directly to our board. 
um, following uh, doing so, one of the first things we did was survey our members in late 2020 on the issues of, of racism to, to, to try and better understand um, those. And we subsequently, off the back of that, actually followed up that survey in 2021 to, to see if the work that we undertook um, in that time um, had, had, had an impact, uh, which it did, which was good. Um, throughout that period, we clearly saw one of our key roles in education. Um, and worked with a third-party company, the EY, uh, EW Group, um, to deliver game-wide education um, to James and Anuj and their colleagues in the professional <coughs> game, um, and I'm sure they can elaborate on that later. Um, uh, through the legal panel I mentioned more recently, um, we had uh, around 20 of our members come forward who were victims of or accused of um, racism in the game during that period in November where you know, lots, lots were happening. So, um, we, uh, along with that and the knowledge that we have through our personal development managers, our, our, our troops on the ground, if you will, um, we are di uh, directly in contact with many members in talking about this critical issue for the game. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to finish by asking uh, James, as a <clears throat> former Glamorgan player, which is... Uh... Back, actually. Sorry. Oh, you're back? Sorry. Back all right. Morgan. Okay. I'm currently Come back. player once again. Fantastic. Uh, and and, and Anuja is a, a player as well. In your experience, what was your reaction to what happened when Azim gave his evidence to the committee and you know, what is your experience in the game you know, around these sorts of issues? Well I think first of all the reaction was one of severe disappointment and I was very hurt by it. Um, I grew up in Swansea, a village just outside Swansea, um, was very fortunate the secondary school I went to backed onto a the local cricket field through an extreme amount of help from my parents, um, both in time and sort of financial means, to get me through all the way to, to turn in professional and to where I am now. I've largely got nothing but great things to say about this sport, the opportunities that it's afforded me. So to hear that there are others who've not had the same experience that I've had is, is really quite hard for me to listen to because I love this sport. Mm. Um, would you like to add anything? I, I personally was, was pretty heartbroken when I, when I heard of uh, Azim giving his, his evidence. Um, not only from what he had to experience but also the fact that a lot of what he had said hit home for me personally. Um, I think it's worthwhile noting that you know, I, like James, have feel very fortunate to, to be playing cricket and, and have a, uh, a great career within the game. Um, to not only be here as, in my position as a current player, but also within the PCA. Um, however, at times in my career, I have had to face issues that I, I felt uncomfortable with. Um, I, I've, I felt haven't been dealt with in the, in the correct way. Um, and unfortunately, what Azim said really did hit home for me. Um, there were instances uh, as I was growing up where Asian players in particular were um, were stereotyped as being lazy, were stereotyped as, as having to work doubly as hard um, to, to be afforded a position in, in professional cricket. Um, I, I remember specific hand gestures that were made for, for players of colour um, and, and also comments that were made um, you know, while senior members of, of staff were, were laughing along. Um, and that to me was, was particularly heartbreaking. Um, I look at my position now and I'm in a very different position to, compared to when I was younger. Um, and yes, I probably would have dealt with things um, differently back then. Um, however, the environment as such was, was as though I didn't want to see, be seen to be a troublemaker. I didn't want to be, have that tarnish on my reputation and um, cricket, as in professional sport, is, is a very cutthroat sport and um, it, you know, it's, it's difficult to make a career in general. So um, I, I was in that position where I had to almost brush things under the carpet and try and, try and get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clive Efford. Just following on from that, because that's quite, quite a powerful statement you've just made. I mean, do you feel that the uh, PCA is in a position to be able to respond to those issues if you went to them and said, look, this is what my experience of playing in the game is today? Do you think there would be a different approach? I think what the PCA are currently doing, I, I feel very positive. I've received the education myself. I, I was sat with um, our players at Derbyshire um, who also received the, the education training. Um, we also, as a, as a club, have, uh, through our board, um, have also received specific training um, outside of the PCA education sessions. 
Um, I think for, uh, the big thing for me was uh, the attitude uh, and, and the culture within the dressing rooms, which is um, obviously one of the big points on the 12-point plan about the dressing room culture review. Um, I think that's going to be the, the, biggest, the biggest thing moving forward is this environment where players feel comfortable challenging um, and also feel comfortable asking questions um, because that I think is the, is the biggest issue at the moment and um, it is the hardest one to, to feel accepted with it within the game. You think that, that, that you feel that that, uh, that pressure to not be a troublemaker to you know ruffle, ruffle people's feathers is, is, is not there anymore that you could come forward and say I don't like this language that's being used I don't uh, you know I don't feel comfortable and that people would listen. I still feel it's there to a certain extent. I think there are clearly issues that are, that are still present within the game, but I think the PCA um, are, doing a, uh, are moving forward in a, in a good way with, um, with the education, um, you know, having experienced it myself mm-hmm. and left those sessions feeling very positive, knowing what I've experienced in the past um, and knowing what current players are experiencing. I think for me it's, it's building a foundation and... and um, building that experience for, for players that they understand what, what certain people are going through because um, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges within the game is actually what, where is that line between banter and, and what is actual discrimination um, and I think that's, that's been lost in the past and, and there have been certain comments that have been made that have always uh, have crossed that boundary um, and I think now it's, it's that approach and, and through what the PCA are delivering to players I think it's um, a really positive thing. Yes. Mr. Effort, if I could just add to that, um, point one in the ECB 12-point plan surrounds game-wide whistleblowing. Um, another, in, uh, independent of that, what uh, we are in the process of doing at the PCA is setting up our own specific whistleblowing line for the, for the PCA. So if our um, delivery is substandard to our members, there is an independent whistleblowing line that will be set up uh, before the season starts for any complaints to be made directly uh, on, on, the, on the PCA uh, and that will be an independent process that we will um, obviously make our members very aware of. Oh, th- th- thanks for that. Uh, Mr Lynch, in answer to uh, my, my colleague just now, you, you, you said you sat down with uh, Azim and, and you'd taken a number of things from the, from the conversation with him. Could, could you just tell us what, it, what specifically? I mean, because we would expect you to say that, but what, what actually do you, did you take from what Azim said to us and what he said to you following his uh, appearance at this committee? Look, uh, I, like many, was so sad watching the evidence that was so powerful. Um, you said that, but what did you learn from, from Azim specifically? I, I specifically learned that we needed to voice um, our pressure p- more publicly, more quickly, on what is, in this instance, Yorkshire and the ECB. And if I was... Uh, in a similar si- uh, situation again, mm. we would do that. I learned uh, a lot of difficult lessons about the complexities on member-on-member disputes and how we would handle those, and that is hence why now we have a legal panel of se- seven barristers in place on retainer with us to, mm. th- that we could put forward to provide their independent support. So one of the things that, he, uh, that Azim described was the, the, the pressure that he felt because... Um, the PCA in particular had uh, people on either side of the argument Um, the the people he was accusing of using racist language were also members of the PCA and he was looking for membership of the PCA now I hear what you say about uh, legal representation but how would it work in practice uh, now if uh, uh, you you were in that situation representing both sides of the argument Uh, I state again about our legal panel so we have Um, it in use right now where we have uh, a member comes in who is accusing uh, or making an accusation we take that uh, request if you like and then we put an independent lawyer directly to give advice to that person subsequently if someone's been accused of something within the game we then again put a lawyer on their side and maintain our independence this was a crucially difficult situation with members on all sides and we were the only organisation who had members on all side. I state again, there are learnings from how we dealt with them, and, and I apologise for those, but I can't change what's gone before, but I can influence tomorrow. Uh, OK, and, and you've quoted the, um, uh, the ECB's uh, 12-point plan. Um, uh, how how uh, much involved with the development of that plan was the PCA? 
Well, I attended the game-wide meeting at the Oval in November, um, and we are a signatory to the plan, as you'll be aware, and we'll play a key role in its implementation. Um, the core areas of the plan um, we will be engaged in. Um, um, I mentioned the whistleblowing hotline, the, and, and we will obviously make uh, that very aware to our uh, members and strengthen the reporting and subsequent discipline, disciplinary arrangements um, within that. Um, as Anuj stated earlier, the culture dressing room review, in my opinion, is the single most important uh, part of the plan. Um, I am in regular contact with Claire Connor, um, who's leading that work stream for the ECB. Um, uh, we both are in firm agreement that it requires independence, and um, there is a tender process which is down to the last two companies to be implemented um, into playing that role of independence. Um, our role within that will be to uh, help with the term, develop the terms of reference um, and then crucially um, speak to our members about the, this uh, review and the wider 12-point plan. Um, and um, once its findings are made, then help with the implementation of that plan. The other key area of the plan is education, as has been stated, and the work that we've done previously I sort of see as a, as a start, as a foundation, because it's clearly we need to do more. And crucially, I also mentioned earlier that um, I and we aren't as geared up as we needed to be to, to tackle these very important issues. And um, I'm delighted that um, as of last week, uh, actually, we are currently recruiting for a uh, director of EDI, a very senior role within the PCA to uh, work with us to develop the education that is required in the game. Um, and that is a, a crucial appointment for us in a small organisation. Um, Perhaps I could just come in on the education point because I have been speaking to Azeem uh, quite regularly uh, since November. Uh, and, we, and I have agreed that we will work with Azeem on the education programme going forward. One of Azeem's uh, very constructive criticisms is that we have been giving EDI training to the first class counties. But uh, uh, some of what has been said has been going one in one ear and out the other. And so how do we really make this training stick? And one of the things we don't have in cricket today is a code of conduct. So there is a clear code of conduct on gambling, on drugs, and it's zero tolerance. And every player knows what the policy is and what the sanction is. We don't have that today on discrimination. We have to have that. It's part of the 12-point plan. There has to be a clear regulatory process. There has to be clear sanction. There has to be zero tolerance. And that is something that we look forward to working with Azeem on uh, in the immediate future. But one of the problems that Azeem highlighted that, that was quite, and quite shocking testimony was as you've alluded to, and is uh, the, the locker room banter, which is not banter. I mean, a, a term like Kevin, it was clearly a racist term designed to be abusive. Um, I, before he gave that evidence, had you ever heard the term Kevin? I, I had heard the term. Um, I, I, in, my, in my past career, I'd heard... Outside of Yorkshire? I'd rather not go into... into well, no, you're here before this committee to give answers, so is, I take it from your, your, that response that it is outside of Yorkshire that you've heard that term. I think, as we've seen, there are issues within the game as a whole. Um, as I've experienced personally, clearly it's not just at Yorkshire. Um, it's within the whole game. Um, there are instances where, um, in, in, in all forms of cricket, um, I, I've experienced um, the, these sorts of things personally. Um, as, I, as I've mentioned, I think the, the key is to look forward and actually what we can do to address these things because um, at the end of the day, we, we as players want to feel socially accepted within professional cricket. Um, the banter is a big part of the sport. Um, it's, it's a tight-knit um, environment within your, within your dressing room side and I can speak of my experience at, at Derbyshire and we have a fantastic group of players, a very strong group of players. Um, and I know that these sorts of things wouldn't happen. Um, we have very strong senior leaders within our team, um, and I, I, I feel fully comfortable within that side. Uh, I think, sorry, can I add something to, to, to that? Just, to, just forgive me for a moment, just to pursue that. 
Because we have a 12-point plan here, and we've just been told that uh, point one is uh, whistleblowing. So given what you've just heard about whistleblowing, I wonder why you're reluctant to tell us where else that term has been used throughout the game. For me, the importance is to, is to look forward. Um, I, I don't feel it's right to, you to go into individuals. You should be seen here as a politician with an answer like that. <laughs> I, I, I personally, for me, I don't think it's... I don't think it's the right thing to do to, to look back on, on individuals and, and details, and I think it's fair to do that. I think for me, my biggest, the, the main reason I, I wanted to get involved within the PCA um, was to look to try and address this issue and, and put it to bed, full stop. Are you saddened by that answer? Look, we, we, we can't change what's gone before us, as I said earlier. We can look forward. Uh, to, is to, that looking forward? He was he's reluctant to say where and, and that racist term is I, I, I am I personally am very saddened by that. And, and, and as you say, let's, let's be truthful. We have a situation in the game today where some members of the game are scared mm. of the ramifications and implications of being honest about what has happened in the past. Mm. And that, that, is, that is deeply sad. I think one of the, the great things so far to come out of this is it's fostering conversations within dressing rooms right now. These have been happening already. We have a lot of dressing rooms, the men's county dressing rooms, the women's county dressing rooms, two sets of 100 dressing rooms, both men and women. And these are high-performing environments. So people not feeling comfortable in those environments is a real issue. And I think the, the testimony that's brought things to light in this room so far has forced people to sit, think, and, and discuss this to make sure that people do feel comfortable in their environment. Um, and for me, that's a positive from where we have been before. Okay. Leave it there, Jim. Thank you, thank you. And, and, and Aja, I completely respect the right, your right in any instance not to disclose instances of racism, absolutely, in that regard. Uh, we had actually picked up the fact that Kevin was used uh, in, in other dressing rooms as well, including the England dressing room in the past. So, but, but thank you anyway for your, your disclosure on that and, and, and the issues you discussed. Um, just sort of turning, as, as, as James and Anish, as, as players, and as, as obviously now you're a part of the organisation uh, as, as vice chairs, um, do you think that the PCA, as it's currently constructed, and as it has been in the recent past, do you think it has the, the power within the game, and I just mean within dressing rooms, but within the, in relationship to the ECB, which obviously mostly fund the PCA, as I understand it, do they have the power in order to effectively, A, really stand up for individual members in cases of, of racial abuse, and then secondly, really move the dial on this issue? What are your own views? Uh, mine personally now is, yes, they do. I think that I've played cricket now professionally for the best part of 15 years. Uh, I've been involved with the PCA more and more over the last four and five um, and was very fortunate to be appointed chair in March of last year. Um, I've seen that needle move a long, long way. Um, I think, yes, as you say, we are part funded by the ECB. Um, a lot of that funding goes back into the players, back into the education, um, helping them in their day-to-day, -day, helping them transition out of cricket into, into different mm. careers once they finish. Um, we sit, and, and I'm fortunate enough now to sit on certain panels at the ECB, and, and we have a player's voice on those. Um, and we hold the ECB to, the, to account where we need to. We feel like we do. And the other side of that is we need to collaborate with ECB as well because a lot of the stuff is, is very joined up and, and important that we do collaborate. So um, I feel like the PCA, from the 15 years that I've been playing professional cricket, has never been in a stronger place than we are right now. I think for myself personally, I feel very fortunate to sit on the, on the EDI group within the PCA. Um, witnessing from the, from the BLM movement and seeing the, the approach that the PCA took um, it was a no-brainer for, for me to be a part of that and, and see all the brilliant work that, um, that, that was taking place. Um, like, like James mentioned, you know, that, that, that dial has moved very quickly, um, and, and rightfully so. Um, but it's clear that racism within the game is, is, is one issue. There, there are other issues. I think we saw with the induction of, of female members to the PCA mm. um, and with Heather Knight as, as our former vice chairman, um, we, we see other issues that, that she presents to us about 
uh, women being treated differently within the game and um, there's clearly a, a lot of things to address. Um, however, I feel now with what we've got within the EDI space, with, with all this education um, that players are going through, I, th I think, I, I personally feel we're in, a, we're in a good state to, to deal with these issues and, um, and hopefully uh, avoid something like this happening, happening again. Mr Lynch, I mean, what, what James and Anish have described there are, are, are very much the, the welfare focus of the PCA and also the educational focus of it. Now, they're relatively easier wins than real power politics within cricket. So and my question, real, real easier time? wins perhaps than real, playing a real power role within cricket. My concerns over the PCA, and these were mentioned by Mr Rafiq when, when he was in front of us, is the fact that he's not really a normal type of union as we would think of a union as one that represents its members and has real sort of power to its elbow in terms of finances, in terms of being able to effectively take employers to tribunal uh, and, and, and matters such as that. Is the PCA sort of suffer to a degree from the fact, A, it's intensely close relationship, joined at the hip, if you like, with the ECB, and also the fact that financially you're not really a, what we would call the proper union in that regard. Is that... I could see, Mr. Medal, you're, you're just you're nodding your head. Is that one of the key issues that, that you come across as uh, in your position, Mr. Lynch, and also Mr. Medal? Uh, can I talk about the relationship with the yeah. ECB and perhaps, Julian, yeah. you can yeah, take definitely. the second one? Um, my uh, description of our relationship with the ECB would be we have a firm but fair relationship. We are, as you state, a, a trade union. Um, and purely by virtue of what we do, we need to have robust conversations with the ECB, which we do often. Um, and as uh, I think Anush said, or James, um, in other areas, such as the EDI agenda, it makes perfect sense to work um, very collaboratively, as we have and as we are doing with the 12-point plan. Um, I, I, I think that we strike the right balance of taking um, what James and uh, our players bring to us as the executive to the ECB through uh, a variety of, I suppose, three different areas on the domestic game through a group called uh, the Player Working Group, which is a, a, a collaboration between um, some county CEOs, uh, myself and one of my senior colleagues, and the ECB on domestic cricket issues, um, and on the England and men's and women's teams um, through uh, sub-bodies of the organisation, the Team England Player Partnership for the men and the equivalent England Women's Player Partnership uh, for, for the women. In those three areas, we have very clear, um, very frank at times conversations, but they're all done um, in, in good nature, which I think is important for any good working relationship. How many players have you represented at Tribunal in the last two years? The employment Tribunal? Um, as a union? I, I don't think we have, in my time um, as okay. Chief Executive... That's a very, very one. key part of being a union in that respect. I'm going to continue, Mr. Medal, first of all, another question I need to ask you, Mr. Yeah. You mentioned the 12-point plan. Is there any part, any part of the 12-point plan you think would not have been present or would have been weaker if you'd not been involved? I think the two very clear areas where the PCA needs to be very involved is the dressing room culture review. These are our and members. I'm not asking whether or not you'd be involved. I'm saying what influence have you had? Uh, show me an example within that 12-point plan where you have had an influence actually moving the dial uh, in the formation of that 12-point plan. I have been very involved in, um, as I say, the, the dressing room culture review and the process um, to, to get to where we are now, working with Claire Connor at the ECB, and the education. One of the survey questions we asked our members was, who do you feel is the best um, body, if you like, to deliver game-wide education on the topic of EDI? And the um, unanimous view was that we were. So point four and point five of the 12 point plan I see as our real key focus and to which we have been Are you involved keen in the formation of that or are you effectively involved in the execution? Uh, we were part of the game-wide meeting at the Oval as a key stakeholder. You both part of that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Maswell, we were discussing there about, you know, Mr. Yes. Mr. Tons about the, the fact that you don't, you don't represent employment tribunals or haven't done so the last few years. That's a resource issue. Where I can understand how this has grown up over time, and this is no reflection, I think, in terms of the people who are involved, and particularly the players who, who really do value the PCA and what it does. I know that from a personal experience. But 
In terms of whether or not you are a proper union or not, I mean, I suspect the answer is really not. We're not. And we are resource constrained. We're financially constrained. We're very grateful to the ECB for the support they give us. I mean, to put it in context for the committee, we have a turnover of about £4 million a year. Last year, during COVID, the ECB support, was because of the, the downturn in commercial, was 70%. In a normal year, when our commercial activities are operating effectively, it would be 50%. But there is no doubt our ability to fund proper legal support and take legal action to, for example, a tribunal where the costs become exponentially greater it is constrained, and that's something that weighs upon us. Thank you. Uh, Simon Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at wider government, governance, if, if I may. Um, with the ECB being both promoter and regulator, it does pose some questions about governance more generally. Um, and I want to just touch on that for a couple of minutes, if I may. Um, in your view, and I don't mind who begins uh, answering this question, is that dual role, as it stands, still acceptable? I think we are still supportive of the ECB as promoter and regulator. Um, we think there needs to be improvement in, in their governance. We welcome the governance review as, as part of the action plan. Um, both governance and some of their operating capability is something we are in active dialogue with the ECB over. Um, we think the uh, ECB board uh, lacks uh, a real uh, cricket expertise. That is, again, something that we... Are, uh, are on record as saying we would like to see more cricket experience uh, within, the, within the ECB board uh, and there are a number of proposals that we will be making as part of the governance review as to how we believe that could be implemented. So, How can they turn around that view of, of, uh, of your uh, body that it doesn't quite uh, work at the moment? When, you're, when we're talking about this dual role that we have with the ECB, even if they um, shaped up, as you as you have just stated, uh, the way that their, that board has experience. How do you think that that can actually make a difference? And will it ever be will it ever be quite right, or is there need for an independent regulator? I think we are all calling into question the you know the independence and the transparency of the governance in cricket today. We share that view. I think this action plan, this governance review, is the ECB and crickets chance to show that they can perform both roles. And I think we agree with this committee that uh, if, if we fail to implement this action plan, this government's review effectively, uh, you know, we, will, we, will be, we will be back in this room discussing the independent regulator for, for this game. I don't think we need to go this far. I think self-regulation can work, although we've got some way to go to prove that to you. How much time are you willing to give it until you can see you know, improvements that will mean that you won't start calling for an independent regulator. Yeah, I think the good news is we've now got a 12-point action plan that is receiving very significant parliamentary and public scrutiny. Uh, I heard Mr. Harrison saying that he will report back to you on a quarterly basis. And if, you know, if, if we are failing as a game to deliver against that plan, I think we will be called to, you know, we, we will be called out. Isn't it better to bite the bullet, though, and perhaps just... Perhaps no, I don't think so. No, I think we, we remain... I mean, the ECB has done a lot of very good things, I mean, and continues to do a lot of very good things. I mean, the way they navigated cricket through COVID, I think, uh, was exceptional. Uh, the way they financed the game uh, through, you know, a fantastic uh, media rights deal, again, is providing huge financial support to the game. I think the 100 has been a great success the support of players through the PCA. So there is a lot that is very good about the ECB. There is a lot as part of this action plan and this inquiry that needs to be addressed. What will be the challenges, do you think, of introducing an independent <clears throat> regulator? Well, who is the regulator? I mean, are we effectively saying that it's government? You know, are we going to create off crick? I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, knows. Mr. Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> We've got enough off, off stump. stump. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it takes the government it, 14 months to appoint a chair as well. <laughs> so I'm hoping that we could uh, that that we can get our house in order and self-regulation can work. Um, what about the fans? A fan-led review. Is that something you'd support? 
Well, PCA, of course, has got no real responsibility, no responsibility for, for the fans. I don't think it's required at this stage. Obviously, we're seeing it in other sports. Um, uh, as part of the action, the 12-point action plan, clearly there are fan-related issues in cricket which need urgent attention. But no, we, the PCA does not support, at today, a fan-led review. Do you think that would, that would do some good to heal some of the wounds that have been opened up in the last 12 months? Uh, given everything else we have to do at the moment, and given, no, I, I don't personally, I think the priorities we've got are the right priorities and we don't see the need today for a fan review. Okay, I'll leave it there. Chair. Thank you. Damien Green? Uh, just uh, picking up on that point about the ECB's um, success or, or otherwise in, in running the game. From you know, your own very particular perspective, are there more or fewer professional cricketers in this country than there were five years ago? There's more. In fact, there's more professional cricketers than ever before in the game. Uh, currently 526 current players, and that's broken down into 461 men and 68 women. The reason for that uh, was primarily due to when the 100 was being played, we had a 50-over competition being played as well, which brought in an influx of players to, um, to the game. We also had a lot of um, players hit by COVID um, last year, and um, um, therefore those numbers are where they are. But um, uh, we expect that to be kind of the new norm, if you like, um, for, for our membership and our focus on supporting them. Yeah, and, and, and for the, uh, the, the current players, does it feel more secure? <laughs> I mean, all sporting careers are obviously insecure uh, for obvious reasons, but does it feel more or less secure than it did a few years ago? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think probably about the same. I mean, it's all tied purely to performance on a sort of individual basis and whether you get another contract. Um, the great thing is that, like um, Julian mentioned, about the, the funding that the ECB managed to secure, and, and from that point of view, for the next period of time, the game is in a, is in a strong position, provided it can deliver on all of that. I think just to, just to add to that, obviously what 100 has done has brought more opportunities for um, new, new employment opportunities to the game as well, and that aligned with the um, global uh, T20 and T10 market as well, the opportunities afforded to a professional cricketer, not to mention also the developments in the women's game, which is hugely important. Um, I think it's, it's no better time to be a professional cricketer uh, with the opportunities in, in, in front of them. Sorry, not sure. It's interesting yeah. that we've got. Can sorry, we I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I think, like Rob mentioned, um, opportunity-wise, as a as a current player with with the hundred, um, you know, it's brought in a financially. Uh, you know, it gives the opportunity for, for players to be financially better off, but but also to compete um, on one of the world's biggest stages. Um, so, you know, I certainly think from from an opportunity point of view, um, you know, the, the game has certainly uh, gotten better. I think. Um, like with all professional sport, I think, um, like James mentioned, it's, it's always going to be uh, purely on performance, uh, a performance basis. And I think, um, touching on a previous point that was mentioned about the voice to the ECB, I think there is um, clearly going to be some need to get, to get more of a player voice on there. Um, I think, um, judging on my, my own personal experience, and, and especially at Derbyshire, we have a, a smaller squad. Um, seeing the demands that players are having to be put through um, and the, the, the tight-knit uh, structure that, that our, our game currently demands, um, it, it does make it very difficult. Um, and you know, having witnessed uh, some of the uh, comments that were made on, on the county structure following the, the Ashes defeat, um, it, it was disappointing to hear, but understandably so, because for us as a smaller county, um, being able to field our, our, our best team um, nine games uh, out of nine when we've got a very um, action-packed schedule week after week playing a, a four-day championship game made it very difficult for us. Um, and, and clearly we weren't, we weren't in a position to put our best side out, whether it was for injury or, or, or try, just trying to safeguard players from a from work, uh, workload basis. So um, clearly it is important. Um, James is obviously the, the voice that we, we filter through, but I, I think it's very important that we have more of a voice uh, that comes from the players uh, to influence the game moving forward. Sorry, Mr. Spear. I was just going to pick up on the women's game point. Um, I mean, we've seen a fourfold increase in the number of uh, professional female cricketers in the last two years, from 17 to 68. 
we've seen salaries increase for the, for the women in the 100 by 100 per cent. We're not there yet, but we are making significant progress in the women's game, which is another key focus for, for the PCA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Giles Waffling. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, it's worth noting that uh, unions come in all shapes and sizes as an erstwhile yes, of member of equity, um, which is a union which represents people who are largely unemployed. makes it very <laughs> difficult. Um, and and I, I would imagine that, that uh, you have your difficulties. Um, so, so as a union, and I think I'm putting this to, to Rob Lynch, um, as a union, what would give you more power to your elbow? Um, certainly that position um, around the ECB boardroom table uh, is, is something that we feel is required. You know, the most important asset to the game is the players. And uh, as Julian has outlined, we've, we feel more input um, and influence uh, within the, the, the matters that are appropriate, because there would be some that are inappropriate, which we would um, sort of step out of. But I think that would sort of give us weight and, and on the sort of uh, employment tribunal point that was referenced earlier, you know, that, that, that's a financial um, point. So, you know, one of our key objectives and, and one of my drivers, especially with my background, which is largely commercial, is to find new commercial revenue that purely goes into that support. So we aren't so reliant on ECB funding uh, and operation, and I'd certainly love to be the CEO that brought that sort of extra independence um, because of that. Okay, I was, look I was looking back at uh, your foundation in 1967, uh, and I note that uh, on, at least I couldn't find it on, on, uh, on your website or, or, or on, in Wikipedia even, um, a statement. I mean, like, what is your say? Is it to hold the ECB to account? Is it to hold the, the counties to account? What would you say your statement would be? Uh, the sort of, you know, the, the one line, if you like, is to champion the ongoing interests of um, professional cricketers in England and Wales. Uh, but you're not holding anybody to account. That's not like uh, uh, other as, unions as, do. As, as we've referenced, I think um, we do hold largely the ECB to account um, within the, the work that we do. Um, but primarily what I am employed to do, who I am judged by, is James and the Players Committee. Um, which consists of 18 representatives from the 18 uh, domestic counties and, 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 and four new players from the women's domestic structure. And we constantly consult with our players committee on issues arising and we take them to the ECB. But it's, it's, would you not agree that it's a, it's a healthy thing to have an organisation such as yours which is looking at the strategies and, and the implement, implementation of such strategies of the senior empowering body, the promoting body, the ECB? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, that's a really, really important question, an important point, and, and one which, um, as a board, we, we need to reflect on. Um, I think the landscape of cricket has changed, and, you know, the, the, the terms that I've used internally is that the PCA needs to be fit for purpose for the modern-day challenges of professional cricket. Now, they have changed. And you would say you do that job effectively? I would say that um, there are errors uh, that we could improve and learnings that we have made, um, as we have discussed. Um, I would like to think that James is the, the, the ultimate um, boss of the organisation, is happy with the work that we do, and the 526 members and 3,100 former players um, are, are happy with the support that the PCA provides. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I, I, and I realise that... Uh, it's founded for former players and current players of first-class cricket. That's what the PCA is all about. But do you go further? Do you, do you reach out to grassroots at all? Are these people who will come through and ultimately be part of the ethos, the, uh, if you like, dressing room banter uh, that, that will grow through? Do you reach out to them at all? Sure. I think there's sort of two parts to this. You know, clearly, as professional cricketers in this country, there is a responsibility as role models to young boys and girls um, in the game. And there are many um, examples of uh, our members um, in such things as coaching. In fact, Anuj is, um, has his own coaching business as well, so maybe he can talk about uh, um, this, this, this point as well. Um, we also go out of our remit, as we've discussed, resources and issue with, with the PCA. So we've, our primary focus is on those current, um, current players and, and, and former professional players. Um, but we do have work that goes into the academies 
the, the level below that comes in because obviously naturally there is a feeding system there into the professional game. In fact, on the uh, topic of, of EDI, um, we've, we've run um, inclusivity workshops within that environment uh, in the last six months or so, and we do other work, and I suppose to prepare those players for the professional um, contract that they may receive thereafter. But we don't, by way of um, work streams, if you like, go below that right into the uh, grassroots. That's simply okay. not our remit. That, that, that's fair enough. But in your relationship with the academies, do you deal with such issues as racism, as it has now come very much to the fore? As, yeah, obviously it's 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 come right bang smack centre in, in, in our game and shocked our game as, as, as we're all well aware. Um, what we have done and felt a responsibility to do because of this is deliver the workshops that I just mentioned and that is to talk about um, to racism and wider issues of discrimination to ultimately create a healthy environment because um, it's all about the review, uh, sorry, the culture and, and, and of those dressing rooms and we need to get to a place where it's organic that those are a much healthier place than the stories we've you have heard the well in the past. being of your members at heart. I'd like to move on. Um, actually, first of all, uh, Mr. Dahl, um, I fully respect your comments about um, uh, some of the things you've heard outside of Yorkshire. But would you say that uh, racism is a game-wide issue, or is it one that's just focused in a few counties? I certainly think, uh, at the moment, I think it's a game-wide issue. Um, I think from what I've personally experienced and uh, as Rob mentioned from my, from my coaching business um, I see lots of young players from, from all sorts of backgrounds um, I see the issues that they have to deal with um, and the opportunities that are afforded to them um, I see the issues of the costs that are involved um, I see more opportunities for, for players from private schools to get more chances to, to play professional cricket um, and I see how difficult it is um, you know, from from players of uh, uh, of difficult upbringings to, to actually get involved in cricket and uh, and feel accepted within the game. Um, I found from from personally my my own experience within the game is that um, at, at a club level in particular, there's there's quite a big emphasis um, on, on drinking within the game, um, uh, and I felt um, personally it was quite difficult to to feel accepted from a from a social point of view. I think um, a longer a lot of younger players will, will have that. Um, uh, you know, from from an Asian background, uh, I, I felt it. Um, obviously, clearly, it wasn't. Uh, you know, my my own beliefs were were, were against that, and um, I, I felt as though it was always harder to to feel socially accepted. Um, and that's why I think it's very important for the whole game as a whole to to come together. Um, Thank you. Thank you. No, that that that's really good because um, it, it's just thought of to uh, not off the top of my head, but I've been thinking about this quite some time. Um, as an organisation, you're in a unique position. You have your members who are first-class cricket players. Uh, should they not be going out into the grassroots and visiting clubs and talking to people about what's happening and, and passing on the ethos that you would like to engender within the game? I put that to you, Mr. Metherell. Mr. Watley, I completely agree. I think one of the, the, you know, the key findings um, that is coming out of this uh, is the issues around pathway. And one way of addressing these pathway issues is putting our role models into that pathway. Yes. And I think you know, uh, it, it offers uh, post-cricket career opportunities for our members, quite a few who struggle to find their feet post-cat post game, and something we would be very supportive of, of working with the first-class counties and the ECB on. Very much so. Um, James? Um, well, I've got to say that we have at times done certain things through the clubs themselves. Um, I would imagine that most clubs are, some clubs are more active than others. But I've definitely been out and spent time at schools and spent time in different environments um, playing, playing with the children, coaching the children um, and being part of their environment and trying to pass on perhaps what I've learned as my time um, as a cricketer. But you, I think You would encourage others in your position to do the same? Well, I would encourage others and I think we could do it more. Is what I like Good. to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm a bit alarmed listening to what you've all been saying this morning in terms of what you do in representing the members of your organisation. Now, you do describe yourself as a trade union, I, and you are registered as a trade union. I'm right in thinking that, aren't I? 
Mr. We, yes. You do. Yes, yes, we are registered. Right. Yes. So I've just looked at what a definition of a trade union is. And it says an organised association of workers in a trade, group of trades or profession formed to protect and further their rights and interests. How do you do that, Mr Lynch? Uh, or do you do that? Yes, one of our core functions is our player welfare and development programme. Um, it's, 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 it's rights and interests in terms of a trade union are far, far wider than that. How do you actually fulfil that? We, if somebody has a problem at work and they come to your organisation, how do you look after them? Yeah, look, absolutely. We, we have um, support and advice that we provide individuals when they have um, matters of dispute with their employers. Absolutely we do. We've got a department that looks after um, the, these areas. They're all very different uh, issues. Um, I, I think what we said at the, the start, there is um, the issue at Yorkshire with the Zeme where we fell short. Um, but um, uh, issues around employment, terms of employment, we absolutely um, work with our players on a very one-to-one -one basis for issues in this space. And in addition to that, we're crucially involved um, in the development of um, such things as the standard employment agreement that domestic cricketers have. We, re we represent the employment and commercial interests of England men's and women's players with the ECB. We deliver on the commercial programmes for the, for the England players. But if somebody comes to you with an issue, and this is a hypothetical issue, not, I'm not talking about um, the cases that we've looked at in this committee. If somebody came to you with an issue of bullying, for instance, in the workplace, how would you handle that? We, we are now um, much better geared up to, to deal with that. The first thing... No, no, you've been in existence quite some time. How so, would you deal with that? So it's a very individual um, situation and one that would need um, to understand the specific issues because some, some of our members simply want to come to us for a voice and to be heard. So if somebody comes to you and they have clearly been bullied and they have evidence to you that they are being bullied in the workplace. Yeah. How would you deal with that as a trade union rep? We would take that to the ECB's um, uh, investigation unit because they are the regulator and we would raise a claim with them and support our member through that process. We would aim to be the police of that process. The police? Of ensuring that the process went well. So you wouldn't directly represent your member? A absolutely, but we can't, we're not the regulator. We would take them in the that process. The trade union rep represents their member, yeah, and I, at, I, the cent I, let me finish. at the centre of everything is representing the interests of that member. Yes. It's not being a police person, it's representing the concerns and issues that member has. Do you actually do that? Y yes, we do, and please don't confuse um, my use of the term police. We, 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 want, we support the member yes. through the process. And that is what I was meaning. We absolutely stand shoulder to shoulder with our members through that process, explaining at times what they're going through, giving them advice, providing them legal advice where appropriate as well. So there's been no cases in recent times of going to an employment tribunal. Have you ever, as an organisation, um, approached any of the um, trade union type solicitors to see if you could do a no-win, no-fee deal for serious issues? Have you ever done that? During my time as Chief Executive of the PCA since um, uh, July 2020, uh, no, we have not. We have set up the legal panel of Why? barristers that Why have I, you I mentioned. Not? Because we, we haven't, being frank with you, had um, uh, too many instances where we've, um, we've needed to. We've I had think very... some of the instances we've heard, you've had a great need. Do, you, do any of your staff have training in representing members at tribunals or county courts or the places that you take? Uh, what take issues that come through a trade union normally because um, you don't need a lawyer to go and represent any member at an at a employment tribunal, county court or anything else. We have two of our staff who are trained in basic legal um, employment matters and we have uh, a panel. Out of how many staff? Out of 26. We're a small organisation. But only two of your members are trained in employment law practices. That's correct, and it's clearly an area because of the complexities of the game. Do you think that's good enough? I, 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 I think we've learnt a lot. No, but do you think that's good enough sitting I, here today? I think that we need to improve in that area, yes. So, 
You've talked a little about women uh, in the game of cricket, and it has grown enormously um, in recent years. Uh, you know, people watch it. They've been the England team have been very successful in recent years. What proportion of your membership is made up of women members? I mentioned earlier we've got 526 current members, of which 68 are females. And has that grown in recent years? Yes, two years ago that number was 17, which represented the England women's team. The balance is from the um, development of the women's domestic structure. And what do you think still is the biggest barrier to more women's cricket being played in this country? Um, I think, uh, bear in mind I'm the daughter of two, uh, sorry, the father of two. (laughs) (laughs) The youngest of five boys, actually. Um, but I am the daughter of... Uh, I'm the father. We start again. We again. You may describe yourself in which other way. This may be breaking news, actually. <laughs> Very embarrassing. <laughs> Keep going, Rob. Uh, I'm the father of two young daughters and hence very driven about the women's uh, um, uh, cricket development. I think there has been some great progress made in the last two years, and we've got a hell of a long way to go. Julian mentioned it earlier. Um, This is one of my key work streams, and um, in in two years that I've been involved in the PCA, we have delivered a a strong white paper to the ECB um, on uh, equality within the game, and there's been some very constructive and uh, collaborative conversations with the ECB from that paper that has led to um, the England women's team having um, very similar and and, and same employment conditions as their male counterparts. The England women's team are now remunerated um, better than they ever have been. Um, as we go down to grassroots level, which is where the pipeline starts, what are you doing as an organisation? Well, well, as, as, um, as we were asked earlier about our relationship with the grassroots, um, that very much is from a role model perspective. And sitting here today talking to you, we have more role models in the professional women's game than we ever have before. And I can tell you from first-hand experience of my seven-year-old daughter and her um, wearing Heather Knight's playing shirt as a nighty to bed is clear ev- evidence of that and long may that continue. We need to, uh, how I term it, chart a path or continue to chart a path for further equality in the game. And as I hopefully have clearly stated, it's a a big part of my... um What exactly are you doing? Because I can trump you on numbers. I've got three daughters and four granddaughters, and I am not aware of any of them ever being asked through their school life to play cricket. So what are you doing at a grassroots level? But, but I, I think it's important to understand what the remit of the PCA is. It's the ECB who have got some good initiatives in women's cricket in the grassroots space. Our job is to complement those by being um, uh, role models, um, looking at the huge success of the 100, which um, I think if anyone that knows about uh, last year, the number one success within cricket was the women's hundred, and what that did for little boys and and girls in following teams. And it has to be has to be a great start. We have come a long way in two years, and I think personally that women's cricket is the big, biggest opportunity afforded to the game currently. I've got to say, sorry, can I yes. add one more thing? The highlight of my summer last year was sat at the Oval on opening night. That was the women's game in the hundred. That was the first, the first game of the hundred to be played. That was a fabulous occasion, and I think that showed to everybody in cricket what an opportunity the women's game now has. And throughout the competition, it only got better and better. Um, so I think that is in a, is in a great place moving well, I forward. I said it's grown exponentially in terms of watching at professional level. I'm not sure it's filtering down. Finally, um, going back to my original question around uh, trade unions, and you said two of your staff. Uh, do this type of thing. Um, could you send to the committee rather than going through it now? You, I think you said you had 26 stuff. Could you send uh, a, a breakdown of the types of roles that all of those people do, please? Um, particularly outlining any representation uh, roles that any of them have. Yes, I can. And, and can I just sort of just be clear over the course of COVID, um, maintaining our staffing levels um, has, has been something we have done through some very difficult financial times. So we haven't recruited, but we are in the process now of recruiting a, f- a few more roles, crucially the EDI director role um, that I mentioned earlier. But uh, I'll be very happy to pro- provide that information for you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Steve Bryan.
Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Just, just finally and briefly, um, we've already touched on COVID and its impact on funding to, to your organisation, but I just wondered if I might let's ask you, Mr Harris, do you have any concerns or have you heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that COVID has put clubs in England and Wales at risk of going bankrupt through their lack of being able to fundraise through clubhouse activities, for instance? I've got to be honest, as a player, I'm not sure that's particularly my, uh, my area of expertise. What do you think, Rob? And, and look, I can't add much more on that. It's not in our remit to understand the, the, the county finances. We're not exposed to that information, so I can't comment any further. OK, and then just, just finally, I just wondered if maybe I could ask any of you. When we did our work on sporting infrastructure, a correspondent of the committee raised the issue of, of the potential of infrastructure requirements leading to sort of religious disparity. So I just wonder if, if any of you have got any concerns around infrastructure funding that goes into the grassroots game being derived from sort of alcohol in the clubhouse, for instance, or lottery funding that may have gone that may hinder the participation of Muslim cricketers. Has that ever come up as an issue? It's not an issue we've ever discussed at the PCA board. I, we can recognise the issue. It is not something the PCA has addressed to date. OK. Anybody else have anything to say on that, Mr Harris? Um, well, if you're sp speaking specifically about alcohol, I can talk about mm. the 15 years that, that I've been a professional sportsman. Um, and it's declining, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I think over those 15 years, the landscape is very different to what it is now because the game is getting more and more professional. Largely. Um, there are times, absolutely, when people have breaks in their calendar where they need to let off some steam and go and have a drink. But on the whole, alcohol consumption has definitely, in my opinion, gone down over the last 15 years. Okay. Mr. Dow, what's your experience? For me personally, at, at Derbyshire, we have, uh, like I mentioned before, a very, very inclusive environment. Um, that was the, the biggest thing and one of the main reasons why I feel so comfortable within that club. Um, like I've experienced from, uh, from in my past that I have felt at times um, that the social norm is, is to go out and have a drink, um, which I feel is, uh, is an issue for players of, of backgrounds and, and face that, that don't, don't choose that to be acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, I think like James mentioned, within professional sport at the moment, it, it certainly is in decline. Um, we've seen lots of, of players being scrutinised because of um, their activities uh, outside of cricket. Um, and we see day to day the, the demands that the game puts us through um, and, and all the hard work that we have to put in. Um, clearly players are, are choosing to, to, to avoid um, alcohol in a sense but um, I think the biggest point is, is the respect of culture. I think that's, uh, that's a really big, uh, really big point to, to mention. We, we've seen lots of, uh, of instances of, uh, of Muslim players in particular um, having different shirts uh, that avoid having um, sponsors' logos that, uh, that have any relation to alcohol on there. Um, I think that's, that, that's a big thing. I, I think it um, is a respect thing for first and, and foremost, uh, and I think there, there needs to be more, more of a case where actually that is, that is considered the normal. I think um, as we've seen through the, through the COVID pandemic, um, finances of clubs in general have been difficult to come by and, um, and I have from, from numerous conversations I've had with our, our chief executive at, at Derbyshire, um, he's always kept us in, in the loop of, of where we stand and um, it's been important to have a voice as a player from, from those matters but um, in terms of alcohol I think there is, um, that there is clear that uh, there are some issues there and, but they are uh, improving. Issues, are they, are they hindrance or are they just issues? Can they be barriers? I, I think there certainly can be barriers from, yeah. a, from, from a team perspective. Um, I think, it, like I said, it, it's the acceptance within the team. Um, you know, I speak from my current uh, playing experience. Um, I, I don't feel as though that's, uh, that's a hindrance. Um, I feel as though senior players in, in particular within, within our side make it feel very comfortable for me to, to engage in all activities and respect uh, my choices and beliefs. Um, and one of, the, one of the biggest reasons why I am um, uh, so engaged within the PCA is I, I want to try and replicate that culture that I have at Derbyshire. Um, and I know Azeem touched on his experience at, at Derbyshire and also. Um, and I want to feel as though that, um, that culture, that environment is, is replicated across the county game. I think this process is starting to happen organically, um, taking into account what's, what's been said in the last sort of six months. and and everything that's taken place. So I feel like the game internally in amongst dressing rooms, and bear in mind obviously you referenced there are a lot of dressing rooms that are all very unique, 
these conversations are happening, I think, as we speak, I think, which can only be a real positive. Good. Can I just finally add to, yeah. that, uh, add to that, you know, that, that point that we are very aware that there has been some, let's call it organic work, that has started uh, because of the events in the game. And it comes back to that point four in the Culture Dressing Room Review, and it's, it's our collective responsibility with the ECB to incorporate that work that has already happened or ongoing in, in those dressing room reviews because there's some, some really good stories and good conversations that are coming, coming out of them. Thank you. Yeah. Kevin Brennan? Just, just briefly, uh, listening to Julie Elliott's question about um, women's cricket and, and agreeing with the way that the 100 has absolutely raised the profile of, of women's cricket you know, hugely in the public eye, I just wondered, um, Mr Dahl, with, with girls from South Asian backgrounds, what do you think, because we've received evidence during the course of, of looking at this that, um, you know, that, that, that that's an issue you know, in, in a community where, where cricket is hugely popular, not enough girls are get an opportunity to play the game. What do you think the, 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 the way forward is on that and, and what role might the 100 play in that? That's a golden, golden question, really. I, I think, yes, we've seen the, the importance um, that the 100 has, has shown on, on women's cricket. Um, from my own personal perspective, I, I try to get more involved within the girls' uh, coaching setup and try to actively seek out and, and coach more um, female cricketers. I found it very difficult to do so um, by trying to approach uh, players in particular. Um, I think the, the difficulty is at the moment is the attitude towards cricket. Um, I think especially from getting involved in, in club cricket and grassroots level, um, I, I think we've seen, or I've seen in particular, how, how much of a challenge it is, um, especially from a from a kind of social acceptance point of view. I, I think that's that's the stereotype that we're, we're trying to address it and, and we really need to address. Um, female cricket in general, I think, is, is massively on the rise and obviously the, the 100 has, has played a significant part of that. Um, but I think clearly there, there needs to be more, more that's done from a, from a, a grassroots level um, to try and get more uh, you know, South Asian uh, females to, to go into the game. Um, I know, I know from, from my own family experience, um, you know, my, my sister and my whole family were, were massive sports, sports fans and, and, and involved hugely in sport. Um, however, my, my sister was never really involved. She, she took the academic route as she thought that was, um, that, that was what needed to be done. Um, so clearly, I think it's, uh, it's a stigma that, that needs to be challenged. I think the more opportunities there are uh, from a younger age to get involved in the game, um, and to feel more comfortable engaging with the sport as a whole, um, that has to be that has to be the norm. That has to be an opportunity that's afforded to everyone, uh, and not just uh, players from certain backgrounds or uh, from certain schools, for example. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Ash, do, you, do you think cricket needs a sort of truth and reconciliation commission? I think it, I think it certainly does. Um, I think from from what we've seen over the past couple of years, um, it, it's brought certain issues uh, to light. Obviously, clearly, it's brought um, racism within the game uh, to the forefront of, uh, of a lot of people. And um, you know, I'm very fortunate that, that this committee is, is challenging those um, and challenging lots of people within the game, uh, as clearly it's it's an issue that's ever so present. Um, I think the, the importance for me and, and where I feel um, it, it's positive is that everyone within the game, not just at professional level, um, everyone within the sport is now um, questioning their, their, their response to this issue. Um, I think it's, that's, that's going to be the need, the need moving forward, um, you know, like I said, not just at professional level, but right from, right from grassroots level. Um, is there any play, I mean, mentioning no names, I completely respect your desire to, 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 to basically try and keep this uh, confidential, but not mention any names. Are there, are there any players that have come to you in recent times and said, you know, actually I said this, or did a sort of Matthew Hoggard type situation? Uh, have you experienced that? I have. Um, a, a few months ago I got a personal message from, uh, from, from a, a former player um, apologising for some of the comments that he made uh, to, to me within a, within a dressing room. Um, and that, to me, was was one of the biggest and most positive things that I felt. Um, it caused him to question some of some of the things he said, um, which, from my personal opinion, is a is a massive factor moving forward. Um, and I think, 
even if it's not made made public and even if if players are not seeking to apologize um i, I think the fact that they're questioning themselves um is an important thing um i think what azim had mentioned about the education going in one ear and out the other ear i, I think is um largely to do with an attitude coming to this uh coming in and receiving education um but you know education is is the foundation it, it's the start point uh, it's not the it's not the solution to to fix it um clearly there's there's issues not, not just about shaming it's about understanding absolutely would you therefore say that it would be healthy for cricket to operate some form of uh even if it's a confidential and private basis a commission in order to ask players and bring players together in order to discuss past instances and lessons learned and understanding and when when it's felt by that person that they've maybe gone over the line that they apologize to the other person so to speak would that be a healthy thing for cricket to do i certainly think so i think from from the education that we've received um it's allowing environments and it's allowing dressing rooms to be open um and the biggest thing that i've said to to the to the players at, at derbyshire is feel free to ask questions um mm. and feel free to come to me if you've um you know if if you want to ask about my 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 background my culture my beliefs um that that is the biggest factor um we need that environment moving forward we need um more of those things um because i think the the, the situation we don't want is for players to feel as though um they can't say anything at all um that i don't think is a is a positive thing i think we need an open environment where fair players feel comfortable challenging um certain comments that have been made um and and asking questions and at the end of the day respecting uh respecting players and their beliefs because that um first and foremost is, is the most important thing yeah, th- thank you for that rob um you do, you'd heard Angela, that I, th- i have to say i thought that was i have to say you know i thought it was deeply impressive and frankly i think that's a really positive thing that we can all take away from this and hopefully we can see some development uh from the ECB with your own cooperation in terms of setting such a, a commission up even if it's private or whatever um but however there are refuse nicks in the game uh i'm thinking uh, in particular of lord tells comments just the other day where he said that there are a group of individuals at yorkshire who are actively seeking seeking to delay and derail, derail reform he cited the ex yorkshire chairman robin smith who my information is has very close ties to colin graves uh and obviously has a very friendly journalist seemingly at the yorkshire post uh and they're suggesting effectively that uh that lord patel's appointment is null and void that his decisions are therefore null and void and that the changes to the trust that need to happen and its relationship with yorkshire in order for international cricket to be secured once again by yorkshire are um are are, are therefore themselves not to be taken into account what is your view rob considering you have many members at yorkshire um of basically that these individuals seem to be uh, ostensibly holding up progress the game is trying to turn over a new page and these individuals seemingly for their own very particular reasons are finding it upon themselves in order to 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 as lord patel says uh, derail this process what's your view rob <sighs> the the situation up there i find very sad this is yorkshire county cricket club one off of the not the most famous cricket club in the world and to watch these events unfold is um extremely sad um i think the the progress in which lord patel is trying to put in place is absolutely the, the right direction and as we've all hopefully shown this morning our, our objective is to to move forward um i am not across the detail and and nor should i be um with well, what's going on across the detail in terms of in, in, in regards to comments in regards to in regards to what the members are doing the 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 small group of individuals our focus in yorkshire is the current players up there and ensuring their welfare um in which we're spending a lot of time up there um because there's a group of individuals very uncertain about mm. what's going on around them and that's where we'll maintain our focus within the environment okay uh, I, i have many concerns about the answer you've just given but anyway look julian metherall you want to to add to that well sure yeah, actually could answer that you could answer the concerns i think you can you can feel what my concerns would be about the answer i've just heard 
Uh, we only know what we read in the press and, and what Lord Patel has said, but if they are accurate, it's abhorrent, it's totally obstructive, and frankly, these are some of the great barriers that we face in trying to make cricket a more inclusive uh, place uh, for the game we love. And these minorities cannot prevail, they won't win, and with your support uh, and the support of the other key stakeholders, we've got to drive this out of the game. There's no place for it in cricket. Okay, thank you. That was, that, was, that was the answer we were, we were hoping for. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes this session. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, Rob, James, and Anaj. Thank you very much for all your evidence today. Uh, we'll be taking a short adjournment by sort of our second panel. Order, order. ...is currently suspended. The proceeding is 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 currently suspended.